Ja. Good evening everyone. Kära alla samman, välkommen. Eh, strålande att vi är er så många. Eh, det är er ju inte rart. Det är er en flott kväll och ett flott program. Eh, hjärtligt välkommen till föredragsserien Djupdyk i andra världskrig som Center for Studier av Holocaust og Livsutsminoriteter arrangerer sammen med Universitetet i Tromsø, og serien er finansiert av Etpos Legat. Men så sammen med oss medarrangemør er Tom Kristiansen, professor i mange, mange, mange år rundt omkring, og de siste årene i Tromsø, han skal dere få møte senere i kveld, for han skal samtale med dagens foreleser. Dere har alle fått denne titt på programmet. Det er... Bare to uker så är er vi här igen. Uh, da er det en ny spännande doktoravhandling på vei. Elise Berggren, som er ved NTNU, uh, som snakker på sporet av tapte hjem. Så i november så är er det krigsseilernes kamp. Da skal jeg selv snakke sammen med Bjørn Tore Rosendal fra krigsseilerregisteret og Norsk Senter for krigsseilerhistorie. Og vi avslutter sesongen med Mary Fulbrook. Uh, by standard to the World War II and Holocaust. Jeg må gi dere noen praktiske ting. Vi er ganske mange her, og det kan hende kommer igjen flere. Det er rømningsveier på begge sider. Ved brannalarm har jeg fått beskjed å si. Da skal dere gå ut, og det er samlingsplass over veien ved Slottsparken. Så pass på. Og mine damer og herrer, det er ikke lov å røke her. And then, uh, after we have ended up here, I uh, will we'll short, shortly introduce the tonight's speaker. Uh, there will be book signing, a possibility here, uh, from, this, um, from the scene uh, with John Keesley. And you can pay here uh, with VIPs. You can also buy some of the books out in the bookshop, but it's probably closes at 8. So I cannot really tell you exactly when we will end this. Maybe it's... 7.30, maybe it's 8 o'clock, or in between. Anyway, welcome, uh, Sir John Keesley. It's an honor to have you here. We've been waiting for you, and people have been chatting on our Facebook postings about the Norwegian campaign. It's been such an interest in all social media groups uh, dealing with World War II. I will introduce uh, today's speaker. Uh, he is a writer, as you can understand, and he's writing books on Second World War, but he's also now a retired Lieutenant General. And Sir John Kisley served in the British Army for 40 years. I think we should close that door, because actually it's a little... It's a kitchen. Kiesley's operational service included Northern Ireland, the Falkland Islands, Bosnia and Iraq as deputy coalition commander. He served three tours of duty in the Ministry of Defense, latterly as assistant chief of the defense staff. His final appointment was director general of the UK Defense Academy. From 2014 to 2017, he was visit a visiting research fellow at the Changing Character of War Center at the University of Oxford, while he was writing his book, who many of you have been discussing and have read and want to hear about now. It's a, his book called Autonomy of a Campaign, the British Fiasco in Norway, 1940. And for this book, Sir John Keesley was awarded the 2018 Duke of Wellington Medal for Military History. The program is so, Sir John Kisley will now talk, give a good lecture, and you sit quiet. <laughs> if you go and pick coffee and the cake, you be very careful so you don't burn your neighbor. And afterwards, Professor Tom Christiansen, my colleague and good friend, and uh, professor at University of Tromsø, which has also published well welcomed books on World War II, will have a talk with Sir John Kisley. And but now, the floor is yours, Sir John Keesley. Welcome. Well, thank you very much indeed for that kind introduction. Good evening, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be back here in Oslo. Um, and it's an honor to be invited to speak as part of this series of deep dives into World War II. 
It's something of a paradox. History is replete with examples of failed military campaigns, yet the failure of military campaigns continues to surprise us. In recent times, for example, we have, to put it mildly, found success to be elusive in campaigns such as those in Iraq and Afghanistan, and as President Putin is probably finding in Ukraine. Political decision makers and their advisors consistently seem to underestimate the challenges, scale, and complexity of military campaigns. It would therefore appear to be axiomatic that greater study of the subject is required. But political decision makers and their advisors seem to reach this conclusion only in retrospect. Greater study would not, of course, guarantee success, but it might at least lead to greater understanding of some of the challenges and might uh, allow people to find better ways to manage them. Now, if study of a failed campaign provides more graphic lessons than that of a successful one, then the British campaign in 1940 makes for a great campaign study. It probably could be titled, How Not to Plan and Conduct a Campaign. <laughs> it's therefore surprising that until recently, it was little studied in the United Kingdom. And that was one of the reasons why I came to write my book, Anatomy of Our Campaign, the British fiasco in Norway, 1940. Now, in the time available, I shall not attempt a comprehensive blow-by-blow -blow account of the campaign, and I'm already assuming that people in this room have a considerable knowledge of the subject. Rather, in the next 45 minutes, I shall focus on those events and factors that contributed to campaign failure before drawing conclusions about the reasons for failure. And I much look forward to uh, Professor Tom Christensen's comments and to our discussion, and indeed to your questions. To understand the campaign, indeed any campaign, it's necessary to understand its context, because the roots of campaign failure usually lie long before the first shot is fired. That was certainly the case with this campaign. And we take the clock back to September 1939 and the outbreak of the war. The first point to make is that the personalities of the senior decision makers, both political and military, and the interaction between them were critical to the campaign from the outset. In September 1939, the British Prime Minister was Neville Chamberlain. A previous advocate of appeasement with Germany, he was considered at the time to be a successful peacetime Prime Minister, riding high in the opinion polls. But he was, by his own admission, unsuited to the role of wartime leadership, not least because he knew very little about military matters or strategy. And as was to become apparent, it wasn't so much that he didn't know the right answers as that he didn't know the right questions to ask. The small war cabinet that he formed was also problematic. Almost all of its members were old friends and colleagues of his. Old indeed, the average age was over 65. They were fellow appeasers, people with whom he felt comfortable. The one exception, and there he is standing right behind Chamberlain, was Winston Churchill, a political opponent, but one whom Chamberlain thought was more trouble outside the cabinet than in it. It was therefore a divided cabinet, although arguably no more so than many cabinets before and indeed since. There were further challenges. Britain's formal alliance with France meant that this was to be coalition warfare, more of which later. 
And this was problematic in the multi-layered organisation for the higher direction of the war. Because above the war cabinet, at least in theory, was the Anglo-French Supreme War Council. And immediately beneath the war cabinet, Chamberlain had introduced a military coordination committee. The service ministers with a cabinet minister in the chair and the chiefs of staff as attendees. It looked good on paper, military coordination, we like that, but it did not produce better military coordination. It proved to be an additional time-consuming element and it contributed to an over-bureaucratic structure which was to prove better suited to peacetime than it was to the fast-moving events of wartime. And it was the source of much frustration. And so we come to the Cabinet's military advisers, the Chiefs of Staff, here seen crossing Whitehall from Downing Street in September 1939. From left to right, General Sir Edmund Arnside, Air Chief Marshal Sir Cyril Newell, and Admiral of the Fleet Sir Dudley Pound. As individuals, they had their limitations. In terms of their professional competence and talents, they were mediocrities. And despite the image that they liked to project of a band of brothers, perfectly in step, you'll notice, they made a poor team, not least as a result of inter-service rivalry. Each of them was actively scheming to advance the interests of his own service at the expense of the other two. It couldn't possibly happen today, of course. <laughs> they also, also suffered from what I call senior officer's disease. I speak as an ex-senior officer. The belief that because they were the most senior, therefore they knew best. This was a pity because their immediate subordinate advisers, the small joint planning subcommittee, consisting of three officers of brigade or equivalent level, one from each service, really were the brightest and best of their generation. But the chiefs frequently ignored or rejected their advice, particularly when it challenged their own assumptions. This was to have unfortunate consequences. It's also important to understand the policy concept, uh, context of the British government's decision-making at this time. Almost unbelievably, there was no formal written strategy as to how the war might be fought. Instead, there were, in practice, five unwritten guiding principles of war policy and strategy that were generally accepted by war cabinet members, albeit with varying degrees of enthusiasm. Firstly, holding together the Anglo-French alliance was unsurprisingly seen as essential. Next, there was what was known as the long war strategy. This held that the Allies' stronger economies could outperform Germany's and that therefore, quote, time is on our side. A war year of three years duration was anticipated from the outset. Then, attracting allies, notably the United States, while at the same time dissuading potential enemies, notably Italy, from forming an alliance with Germany was deemed to be highly important, as was maintaining cohesion within the British Empire, not to be taken for granted. Lastly, and for some most importantly, Avoiding the attritional slaughter that had characterised the Great War on the Western Front, as the historian Michael Howard has pointed out, never again was not just an epitaph, it had become a guiding principle of strategy. In terms of the campaign in Norway, there was a sixth, I beg your pardon, there was a sixth uh, principle. The day after war on Germany was declared, the War Cabinet agreed that an attack on Norway should be treated as tantamount to an attack on Britain itself, and that this should be communicated to the Norwegian government. Now, this pledge can be seen as a, a noble commitment, 
but it was not unconnected to the British government's stated assumption that in the face of British naval superiority, a seaborne invasion by Germany directed against uh, Norway's western seaboard can be dismissed in, quote, as entirely impractical. This was an assumption that no one in cabinet challenged at the time or subsequently until it happened. No member of the war cabinet believed that the pledge for support would ever have to be fulfilled. Nor was the pledge unconnected to the British government's desire to have the whole of the large Norwegian merchant fleet loaned to Britain, a desire that became a reality later that month. The genesis of the campaign can be traced to the early days of September 1939, when the Ministry of Economic Warfare produced a paper drawing attention to Germany's critical dependence on the import of Swedish iron ore. And the winter transit of this by German freighters from the port of Narvik down to Germany. On the 19th of September, Churchill, Minister for the Royal Navy, proposed to the War Cabinet that if diplomatic pressure to prevent this should fail, then the Royal Navy should take military action, namely laying a minefield inside Norwegian territorial waters to drive the German freighters out into international waters where they could be attacked. Now, since his proposal involved violating Norwegian territorial integrity and indeed international law, it was met with limited enthusiasm by the War Cabinet. As the records of the meeting shows, they, quote, took note and moved on. Not to be put off, Churchill returned to the charge a month later and again in November, with much the same result. Although the chiefs were tasked with examining options, including the deployment of an expeditionary force to Norway. The chiefs were rightly wary of a new open-ended commitment, with General Ironside declaring that he was opposed to land operations in Norway, quote, in any circumstances. But Churchill's case was greatly strengthened at the end of November with the Soviet invasion of Finland and much public support in Britain for the gallant Finns. In France, public opinion was even more vociferous in its support for the Finns. Prime Minister Edward de Ladier found himself under pressure from within his own divided cabinet to take action. At a meeting of the Supreme War Council in Paris on the 19th of December, de Ladier urged action against the iron ore trade, a proposal enthusiastically supported by Churchill and, more surprisingly, by Ironside, apparently swept along by Churchill's enthusiasm. Just three days previously, Ironside had written in his diary, there will be no sideshows if I can prevent the starting of them. Yet after the Supreme War Council meeting, he wrote proudly in his diary, quote, I told them that here was a legitimate sideshow. The Chiefs of Staff now developed two options, a force of two brigades to deploy to Narvik, and secondly, a large expeditionary force to deploy to central Norway, uh, uh, southern Norway, and Sweden, referred to as the major project. Although no numbers were specified, it's surprising that they made that decision on the 12th of January, approving the major project. Now, the next two months were characterised by strategic indecision and vacillation. One moment swinging towards action, the next swinging away from it. The force was stood to, special troops, including a ski battalion, were raised, then it was stood down. But the scale of this sideshow only gradually emerged. The initial force alone would number 80,000 men with 10,000 vehicles. It would need 12 ocean liners and 39 stores ship to move them. And doing so would take 60 days. 
two months. The joint planners were highly critical of the whole project, warning of the low state of training and readiness of the troops, and describing the plan as, quote, not militarily sound. But the chiefs chose not to pass on this warning to the War Cabinet. On the 5th of February, the Supreme War Council, under much French pressure, approved plans for the dispatch of a combined Anglo-French force, which de Ladier was quick to propose should be under British command, thus distancing himself from a bad outcome and incidentally ensuring that future books about the campaign would be entitled The British Fiasco in Norway. <laughs> the plan was for the force to land at Narvik and progress into Sweden and Finland, into Finland by invitation. This would, of course, require the approval of the Norwegian and Swedish governments, but the possibility to gain such approval was dismissed on no evidence but on much wishful thinking, as, quote, a very remote contingency. In the following fortnight, the practicality of the decision became un came under further criticism, not least when it emerged that the Norwegian and Swedish governments were horrified at the proposal and its impact on their neutrality. No combined planning or liaison had taken place. There was not even a military attaché in Oslo. In late February, the War Cabinet changed its mind and decided against immediate action. But just three days later, under much French pressure, it changed its mind back again and decided to go ahead. On the 12th of March, with the troops already embarked in warships, the War Cabinet ordered the expedition's deployment. As he left the meeting, Newell, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, remarked that he considered the decision, quote, harebrained, mad, but he had raised no objection to it during the meeting. Fortunately, the whole thing was academic. That night, Finland surrendered. The troops were disembarked, the forces dispersed. The special units, including the ski battalion, were disbanded and many people in Whitehall heaved a huge sigh of relief. It's worth just comparing and contrasting the British decision-making and planning with what was happening in Germany. In October uh, 1939, Grand Admiral Rader, head of the German uh, Navy, briefed Hitler about the strategic importance to Germany of Norway and the need to preempt any Allied action. In December, Rader returned to see Hitler to seek his approval for preemptive action, this time taking with him Vidkun Quisling. Their briefing excited Hitler's imagination. He ordered a feasibility study to be carried out in great secrecy by a three-man team reporting to Armed Forces Central Command. Then, in mid-February, on the basis of their report, he tasked this man, a corps commander, Lieutenant General von Falkenhorst, and his corps headquarters to plan and command the operation, in effect creating a theatre or operational level of command. After a fortnight's intense, thorough professional planning, including a comprehensive intelligence assessment, Falkenhorst produced his detailed plan, Plan Weser Ubung. It was for simultaneous landings by air and sea in both Norway and Denmark. 100,000 men, 1,000 aircraft, half of them transports. And it followed the German maxim of Klotzen nicht klecken, that's clout, don't dribble. On the 1st of March, Hitler approved and issued a Führer directive. And you can contrast the German approach, swift, professional, decisive, which makes the British approach look thoroughly amateur, indecisive, and ineffectual. Back in London, there was much pressure on Chamberlain to do something. Pressure from his own Conservative Party, from the parliamentary opposition, from the media, and from France, 
where Deladier, castigated for his inaction, had been replaced by his finance minister, Paul Renault. The pressure represented something familiar to more modern campaigns, the dangerous something-must-be-done syndrome. On the 27th of March at the War Council, the Chiefs of Staff warned that action should not be taken purely, quote, for the sake of doing something. But for Chamberlain, doing nothing was no longer an option. The War Cabinet fell back on the plans to lay the minefield and to do so the following week, and to have the previously planned expeditionary force again embarked ready to deploy to Norway if the Germans reacted. The Chiefs of Staff totally failed to warn that the previous plan could not be resurrected at a moment's notice, not least because the War Office had ordered all the existing plans to be destroyed. Two days later, the Supreme War Council agreed the War Cabinet's plan. And what followed was frenetic military preparations. But on the 30th of March, the distraction of a cabinet reshuffle, including Churchill to chair that key military coordination committee and with increased powers. Now planning started to get overtaken by events. There was a catastrophic intelligence failure to spot German preparations to invade Norway, despite no shortage of indicators. Major factors in this failure were a lack of professional intelligence staffs, no central coordination intelligence, groupthink, and a tendency for senior officers to ignore their intelligence staffs and rely on their own instincts. On the 7th of April, the German fleet was spotted leaving port, and the British fleet set sail from Scarpa Flow in the Shetland Islands to intercept them, and only just missed doing so. But two days later, on the 9th of April, in the early hours, came news of the German invasion of Norway and Denmark. But the fog of war meant that these reports were incomplete and in some cases contradictory. In Whitehall, there was confused, muddled decision-making, agreement to a military response, but failure to think through and prioritise. Should priority, the main effort, be Narvik, as Churchill forcefully argued, or Trondheim and central Norway, as most other people thought? But Churchill's voice was the loudest. The Chiefs of Staff, contrary to strong advice from their joint planners, acquiesced and a force was dispatched. On the 10th and 13th of April, the Royal Navy, already in the area laying mines, conducted successful raids on German shipping in Narvik Harbour. And ironically, it was on the 13th of April that the Chiefs of Staff and the War Cabinet at last recognised that Trondheim was the top priority. It was only now that the picture emerged as to what had actually happened. The picture of the German invasion, early on the 9th of April, almost exactly as planned, meeting little resistance, although one significant blow was the sinking of the heavy cruiser Blücher in Oslord Field, not least because on board had been the SS detachment tasked with arresting key political figures. They heard that German troops had marched unopposed into Oslo, but that King Haakon had escaped together with members of parliament, and he was personifying resistance to the invaders with a rallying call radio broadcast to the nation. They also heard that a new military commander, Major General Otto Ruger, had been appointed and was leading that military resistance, and that the head of the Secret Intelligence Service station from the British Embassy was co-located with him. Indeed, on the evening of the 13th of April, Chamberlain received a telegram from Ruger describing the fight back and requesting immediate assistance. Chamberlain replied, quote, we are coming and in great strength. We shall return to that, short, that uh, fight back shortly, but first a look at what was happening further north, at Narvik. 
The British Expeditionary Force heading there set sail on the 10th of April. It consisted of two infantry brigades, one of regular soldiers, one of reservists. Its commander was under orders from the War Office to land at nearby Harstadt and await reinforcements, including a second echelon brigade of Chasseurs Alpins, French mountain troops. The orders stated, quote, it is not intended that you land in the face of opposition. Now, the expedition planning was amateur and cack-handed in the extreme. There was no centralised command and control, no centralised intelligence. The naval and army commanders nominated separately, their orders contradictory. The newly appointed naval commander indeed had no written orders at all. And there had been no thought to the compatibility of the commanders. Both were highly egotistical. On the left, the Navy commander, Admiral of the Fleet, the Earl of Cork, aged 66 and recalled from retirement by his friend Churchill, was well known throughout the Navy as a pugnacious and irascible fire eater. And the Army commander, Major General Pierce Mackesy, 10 years his junior, was known throughout the Army as a strong-willed and obdurate officer. It was a marriage made in hell. <laughs> On the 13th of April, the convoy, en route, received orders to split. The ship carrying the reservist brigade was told to divert to the Trondheim area and there to join up with another reservist brigade. The following day, Mackesy and the regular brigade arrived at Harstadt there was minimal liaison with the Norwegian forces. Mackesy's chief of staff met with the chief of staff to the local Norwegian commander, Major General Carl Gustav Fleischer. And the daughter of that uh, Norwegian chief of staff is sitting in the audience here. But Mackesy saw no reason to establish personal relationships with his opposite number. Not that he would have considered Fleischer as his opposite number anyway or even to exchange liaison officers, a basic error. Cork, spurred on by Churchill, urged an immediate coup de main attack. Aids. Its battalions had had only basic training and no landing craft. Nor were the ships what's called tactically loaded, that is to say loaded, ready for immediate action. Cork was not sufficiently sure of himself to give Mackesy a direct order. After a week of bitter wrangling, the assault was called off. The moment for a coup de main operation had long since passed. So turning to central Norway, on the 13th of April, there were two reservist brigades heading for the Trondheim area. The one which had been heading to Narvik, by the way, without its commander, who was on another ship. The brigades had no orders. Churchill and the Military Coordination Committee directed the planning of a seaborne atta uh, attack on the town itself, with small diversionary landings at harbours to the north and south. This was contrary to the advice of the joint planners and of the Commander-in-Chief fleet, but the decision resulted from much Churchillian emotional pressure on the Military Coordination Committee, characterised by late-night acrimonious, alcohol fueled confrontations. The Royal Navy dug their heels in. And on 20th April, the direct assault was cancelled. Instead, the Military Coordination Committee directed that there should be pincer attacks from the ports to the north and south. This was where real war and war on paper parted company. Because for neither attack, had there been any planning whatsoever. Both involved only partially trained reservist brigades, minus much of their equipment, without artillery, mortars, air defence, anti-tank weapons, logistics, or even maps. The force was hastily pushed ashore through tiny, inadequate ports, unable to manoeuvre off-roads through the snow, without hot food or shelter. Their opponents 
were well-organised, well-trained and well-equipped German troops, including ski troops, operating as all-arms formations and, significantly, with air superiority. The results in both cases was predictable. A major factor was air operations. The Royal Air Force had a small number of very outdated aircraft operating from airfields in Britain at maximum range and therefore with a very short time over target. They had no ground-to-air communications, they had no liaison, and each mission was coordinated at an absurdly high level, namely in Whitehall between the War Office and the Air Ministry. The Northern Force at Namsos, which landed at night in administrative chaos, consisting of a reservist brigade, was joined three days later by a brigade of chasseurs alpins, the French mountain troops. Also in some administrative chaos, for example, they had skis, but no bindings. <laughs> and no transport. As at Narvik, the British commanders did not establish close relations with Norwegian forces or even inform them of the overall plan, having evidently been briefed that Norwegian forces were infiltrated by supporters of Vidkun Quisling. And they decided, <clears throat> on little or no evidence, that they were in any case, quote, of little fighting value. This view was not shared by Lieutenant Snedden, the British liaison officer with the local Norwegian brigade. He reported that, quote, morale has been much underrated. They are very keen. Some of the wilder elements have to be held back. They have undoubtedly got guts, and they are very bitter against the Germans. His report was disregarded. The fact that the liaison officer was a mere lieutenant says much about the perceived importance of the Norwegian military to the British. Within a week, the British brigade, hastily pushed south and overextended, was routed by German forces advancing north out of Trondheim, and Namsos was utterly destroyed by the Luftwaffe. The southern force at Ondelsnes was also a reservist brigade, but of only two battalions. They rushed south to assist Norwegian troops trying to stop a German link-up coming north from Oslo. But the British unit's inadequacies was exposed by a far from elite German force. But unlike the British, all arms and trained in and operating to a common doctrine. Two elements of that doctrine proved critical. Achieving high tempo, that's the rate of activity relative to your enemy, and also high manoeuvre, manoeuvring round opposition. The British troops were cut off and routed. They ran, many ending up as prisoners of war. Their attitude of mind is revealed in sh with shocking candour by the regimental historian of one of the British battalions when he wrote, quote, there was no reason for the last man and the last round. The criterion of success therefore resolved itself into a reckoning of souls saved to fight another day under more favourable conditions. A reinforcement battalion was rushed from France to assist, but it was too little too late. It could only delay the inevitable evacuation. Like Namsos, Ondelsnes was completely destroyed by the Royal Air Force. Back in London, the War Cabinet was reluctant to accept that the pincer strategy was doomed. But finally, on the 26th of April, they accepted the inevitable and agreed to the evacuation of those Allied troops in central Norway. This was presented as a fait accompli to the French at the Supreme War Council the following day, and they were horrified. Almost unbelievably, Norwegian commanders at Namsos and Ondelsnes were not informed by the British of the decision to evacuate until the evacuation ships were actually loading. Immediately thereafter, at the political level in London, 
there was little focus on strategy, on the process of balancing the desired ends with the available ways and means. Instead, political focus was on political survival, thus on self-justification, on saving face, on the inevitable media plan. The political repercussions are well known. The House of Commons debate, the 7th and 8th of May, the vote of confidence, Chamberlain's resignation, and on the 10th of May, Churchill became Prime Minister, the same day that Germany invaded Holland and Belgium. Now, at first, the War Cabinet failed to see the campaign in Norway in the context of the war as a whole and the obvious competing priority of the Western Front. Churchill was reluctant to prioritise or to contemplate complete withdrawal from Norway. As with many campaigns, this one had developed a momentum all of its own. Staffs in the service ministries had found it hard enough dealing with one campaign. Now dealing with two, they were quite overwhelmed. Back on the Narvik front, there was continued pressure by Churchill for a direct assault, continued acrimonious disagreement between, between Cork and Mackesy, who were no longer on speaking terms. In the meantime, Norwegian ski troops were involved in hard fighting in the mountains, putting increasing pressure on the Germans, all the more so when they were reinforced by a brigade of Chasseurs Alpins and the arrival of two battalions of the Foreign Legion and a brigade of four Polish battalions raised in France with artillery, some air defence and some landing craft. The Germans were very hard pressed and seriously contemplating withdrawal across the Swedish border. On the 13th of May, Mackesy was sacked, replaced by Lieutenant General Sir Claude Auchinleft, on the left here with his RAF commander, Group Captain Moore. Now, it's worth noting that unlike other British senior commanders, Auchinleck, and indeed the French commander, Brigadier General Betuart, established good working relations with local Norwegian commanders. Attention now, though, was further south, between Trondheim and Narvik, and the action to prevent German overland link-up operations from north of Namenswas. The British forces were hastily deployed, in insufficient numbers, poorly trained and equipped, and totally outclassed and brushed aside by the German mountain troops operating with air superiority. The British troops were evacuated from Boda on the 31st of May, again effectively deserting the Norwegian troops. Meanwhile, the decision had been taken to evacuate from Narvik after its capture. The successful assault took place on the 28th of May, actually the day after the Dunkirk evacuation started, by Norwegian, French and Polish troops driving the Germans into the mountains. Effective cover for the evacuation, but, and that took place successfully on the 4th to the 8th of, May, of June. There was one final tragedy to be played out in the British campaign, and one that in many ways typified it. The assault aircraft carrier Glorious, travelling back to Scotland outside a convoy and accompanied by only two destroyers, was intercepted by a German naval task force, including the battleships Scharnhorst and Neisenau. Significantly, none of the carrier's reconnaissance aircraft were deployed. Within two hours, all three British ships were sunk. 1,500 lives were lost. There were only 45 survivors. Thus ended the British campaign in Norway. So what conclusions can we draw about the reasons for failure of the campaign? And this is where I think a, a deep dive is rather important and a shallow dive rather dangerous. Let me explain. Some historians have laid the blame for the failure of that campaign almost entirely at the door of the interwar British governments which failed to rearm the armed forces more than they did. Now, it's certainly the case that 
Had the British government spent more money on the armed forces between the world wars, there would have been more soldiers, better equipped, modern aircraft and ships, better communications and logistics, all of which would have made success more likely. But this argument can mask the truth. Strategists have to cut their coat according to the cloth that is available. Although the face of campaign failure was at the tactical level, notably the dire performance of the infantry battalions, the major factors in campaign failure are to be found at the strategic level. Two are obvious. The catastrophic failure of intelligence, which allowed Operation Vesa Ubung to achieve complete strategic surprise, and the domination of German air power, which proved so decisive. Many analyses of the campaign famous, focus almost entirely on these factors, obscuring other flaws and errors of judgment, which together combined to prescribe disaster. In terms of errors of judgment, there were certainly a number of highly placed decision makers, both civilian and military, who made really bad decisions at critical moments or failed to make decisions at all when they were needed. Foremost amongst those individuals are Chamberlain and Churchill, particularly Churchill. He was to admit as much after the war and indeed saw to it that no official British report was written after that campaign, unlike the 1940 campaign in France. But the three chiefs of staff, particularly Arnside, all showed very poor judgment in key strategic decisions or in the advice they were providing. Again, though, these errors of judgment and decision-making by individuals are only part of the explanation for campaign failure. There were other, more systemic failures at the strategic level. Firstly, organisational. The organisation of the higher direction of the war at, was, as we saw earlier, flawed. The multi-layered, over-bureaucratic committee structure proved not only to be far too time-consuming and energy-sapping for attendees, but also with operations being taken in the Military uh, Coordination Committee far too slow, resulting in decisions being overtaken by events and a pernicious cycle of order, counter-order, disorder. In addition, there was a lack of a system for proper coordination between government departments. There was no joint service, command and control of operations beneath the chiefs of staff, and no joint force commander and headquarters for deployed forces, thus no theatre level of command. An even more important factor was a conceptual one. At the highest level of strategy, the national or grand strategic level, there was perversely an absence of strategy. That is to say, of a process of balancing the desired ends to be achieved with the ways and means available. The War Cabinet tended to arrive at its declared policy without submitting its desired policy to this process. Unsurprisingly, its declared policy and the plans that resulted were often highly impractical and divorced from reality. Now, this tendency resulted from an over-rigid interpretation of the principle of civil primacy in the civil-military relationship, with ministers objecting to having their opinions challenged, and the chiefs viewing strategy as simply the translation of policy into plans, and thus a one-way street. The chiefs, as we have seen, often failed to question ministers' opinions, even when they considered a proposed policy harebrained, or to state realistic risk assessments. Neither ministers nor the chiefs seem to have seen strategy as the continuous, dynamic and iterative process that it should be. The other main strategic level factors contributing to campaign failure can loosely be described as cultural, firstly political and then military. At the political level, the prevalence in the war cabinet of vacillation and indecision, wishful thinking, unjustified optimism in planning and decision-making, 
the tendency of ministers to avoid discussion of strategy and instead focus on tactics. A failure to challenge assumptions, most notably that key assumption that the Germans would never attempt a seaborne invasion of the west coast of Norway. A failure to cross-examine the chiefs of staff on their advice. Bowing to the something-must-be-done syndrome. And lastly, but maybe most importantly, a gross underestimation of the impact in war of Clausewitzian friction, what Clausewitz described as, quote, the concept that differentiates actual war from war on paper. Then at the military level and within the military, a failure to, combine, to fight a combined campaign with Norwegian forces, or indeed to treat the French with equal partner, as equal partners in the campaign. Indeed, the campaign provides an object lesson in how not to conduct multinational operations. The lack of doctrine and the over-reliance on improvisation. A serious underestimation of German military capability. A failure of the chiefs in their relationship with the political masters to speak truth to power. For example, Arnside knew the state of the reservist units and formations was such that they were completely unfit for operations. But he did not mention it, fearing that the blame might fall on him. Pernicious inter-service rivalry and blinkered single-service thinking. Senior officers' disease, arrogance and hubris. Failure to think conceptually, for example, about strategy. The result, I would suggest, of inadequate professional military education. And lastly, throughout, a cult of amateurism. So to end, a couple of final thoughts. First, there were, as we've seen, many contributory factors to the failure of the British campaign in Norway in 1940. And although the face of failure was at the tactical level, the main reasons for that failure were failures of strategy. The campaign illustrates that good strategy is elusive. Many factors conspire to make it so, particularly at the grand strategic level, particularly in a democracy, and particularly within a coalition. Indeed, in these circumstances, as more recent campaigns have shown, it's more likely and far easier for bad strategy to result. Lastly, campaigns that end in ignominious failure and have few redeeming features tend to be forgotten quite quickly. This was certainly the case with this campaign in the United Kingdom. And there were a number of participants who were quite happy that this was so. The danger in this is of failing to learn from bitter experience. Analysis of this campaign serves not only to provide a better understanding of the reasons for its failure, but perhaps more importantly, to provide a better understanding of campaigns in general and of the pitfalls that await the unwary. The British campaign in Norway 1940 was a sorry tale, but it is also a cautionary one. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And uh, I think that people should read the book. It's uh, not only extremely interesting and, and well researched, but it's also well written. And I would like I to say so. It's, it's extremely well written and clear. I, I, I noted something uh, here that it, one reviewer said that it probably had to do with your background as one who gave orders. So the language needed to be clear and to the point. What do you, what do you think? Uh, very kind of you to say so. Um, but certainly I think, unfortunately in the experience I had in the military and in the Ministry of Defence, to understand a bit about what was actually happening on the ground and also what was happening in the decision making and in the interaction between senior military advisers and their political masters. 
And I have to say that, in my experience, all didn't go entirely according to plan in some of the later campaigns. <laughs> uh, there was one point that you didn't, um, didn't mention in your uh, conclusion, and that was, uh, which you uh, really write well about in your book, uh, that's Chamberlain's tendency to postpone decisions and to run war by committee. Uh, there is a calculation in the book that the service chiefs took part in some 92 meetings only in April. Uh, and it is glaringly obvious that um, time would be better spent on, on, on running the campaign. So my question is, that's not the case anymore. Or how, how much time did you spend on, <laughs> on, on meeting during uh, the big camp campaigns? In the campaign in Norway, the committee structure that I outlined was definitely counterproductive. And the chiefs of staff were exhausted because not only were they incredibly busy during the day, but Churchill's meetings were almost always held at night. So they got no sleep. And after several weeks of this, um, they were completely exhausted. And Churchill was such a forceful arguer, arguing his point. Mm. And they felt sort of browbeaten by him, even when they were opposing what he was uh, uh, suggesting. Mm. So I think nowadays, um, the committee structure is far more geared to operations, but maybe learnt by hard lessons. Yeah. Mm. Well, I think we need to talk about Churchill a little bit more, because I'm, I'm writing a new book, and I'm very much into a lot of his uh, 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 a lot of his plans and things he did uh, during the war. Um, uh, just before Christmas in 1970, General David Fraser wrote a private letter to Professor Peace Mackesy about the Navi campaign. Fraser, he was uh, the son of Brigadier William Fraser, who commanded the 24th uh, Guards Brigade at Narvik. Mackesy was the historian, was the son of General Mackesy, who commanded the Allied uh, land forces in, uh, in Narvik from the 14th of April till he was dismissed on the 13th of May. And both men were obsessed by the fate of the fathers. General Fraser put the blame on Winston Churchill for the failure, both as first, sea lord, first Lord of the Admiralty and then as Prime Minister after the evacuation of Southern Norway. And I quote what he says about Churchill. The whole expedition was so deplorably organized that it is still hard to believe that it could have been conceived by responsible men. And then he turned up the temperature. Quote, the episode itself and its subsequent treatment by him in retrospect showed Churchill at his worst, an excitable amateur of strategy combining romanticism, energy, instability, personal ambition, and spite in an infernal brew. But I greatly blame the chiefs of staff. Uh, they were both weak and inept. They were weak to allow Churchill his head, and inept in completely failing to understand the military problems involved. Uh, so my, I think Churchill, after the war, as, as I alluded to, realized that he had been hugely responsible for the campaign, and indeed, in the draft of writing his book, The Second World War, he writes, quote, it, given that I had such responsibility for it, it is a miracle that I survived. Mm. <laughs> and of course, Churchill was the main beneficiary of the failure of the British campaign. Mm. Chamberlain resigned, Churchill became Prime Minister. It's ironic, uh, in a way, 
how lucky Britain was that he became prime minister because he's such a good wartime prime minister. But the campaign in 1940 was certainly not his finest hour. No, definitely not. But Churchill also said after the war that history will treat me kind because... Because I shall be writing it. I shall it. be writing it. <laughs> <laughs> and he wrote vo volume very important, on volume. Very important point yeah. to remember that. Uh, another point, uh, the more I read about and study General Mackesy, the more sympathy I, 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 I get with him. Uh, he was obviously a difficult man. He could be arrogant and narrow-minded, but he was given the blame for uh, the problems in, in, in northern Norway. And, well, as you said, he refused to attack Narvik without proper pre preparations and, and equipment because it could result in what he called an Arctic uh, Gallipoli. What, what, wasn't that something of a stretch? Historians still dispute whether Mackesy should actually have gone ahead with a coup de main operation, despite all the difficulties and challenges that he faced, that he represented to Cork. Because if you read the German accounts, the German forces in Narvik at the time were in some state of disorganization. They had not really uh, got sorted out by that stage. They had just uh, um, arrived there. They had uh, had uh, quite a time at the hands of the Royal Navy and a state of chaos. And some historians say, actually, if a coup de main op operation had taken place straight away, the Germans would have folded. But I'm not so sure. Um, having been a member of one of the battalions who were there, the Scots Guards, um, the state of training of the two battalions, who'd both been doing ceremonial duties in London before, were not well trained collectively, maybe not individually, were not physically uh, as fit as they should have been. And I think it would indeed have been one of the major disasters um, for the British Army in the war. Mm. And I doubt Churchill would have survived it. I think that one of the key figures in the Norwegian campaign, as you uh, implied, that was General Auchinleck. Uh, in my view, he is possibly the most important officer in the North in 1940. He commanded the uh, Allied Land Forces in, at Narvik from the 13th of May. And he was also, the, uh, as you mentioned, uh, responsible for the evacuation of 27,000 men, uh, Allied uh, troops. And it, I think it may be argued that his main contribution to the campaign is what you, what you said, that he was able to overcome the unpleasant relations between uh, the British and the Norwegians and between uh, uh, his supreme commander, Cork and the army. And he was actually able, as you mentioned, uh, to establish a quite cordial working relationship with the Norwegian and also the French and, and, and the Polish forces. And uh, um, he was uh, ordered, of course, and had no choice but to evacuate uh, 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 Norway. But he, he tried to resist, didn't he? He did, um, and I'm a great fan of General Auchinleck. Uh, later in the war, of course, he commanded British forces in the desert um, uh, and was sacked from that, uh, again, uh, unfairly. But he came very late to the campaign in Norway. He knew nothing, really, about the operations. He was appointed at very short notice. He was an officer of the Indian Army. He had spent his whole time commanding uh, British forces and indeed Indian uh, units in India. Um, he never left his headquarters for the whole time he was in Norway. He didn't go to visit his units, which arguably he didn't have time to do, but it's a pretty basic principle that you go and visit face to face your subordinate commanders. And I don't think he realized just how badly trained the British forces were. He was used to the Indian Army, which had a very high standard of training. 
uh, he expected the British forces, the ground forces, the army, to be much better than he were. And he didn't really uh, know much about the Germans and the German capability. Um, he had never fought in a campaign where air power played such an mm. extent as it did here. And I think some of his decisions um, are open to question, although it wouldn't have altered mm. uh, matters as, as, as it happened. But um, Churchill took against him mm. after the Norway campaign because uh, Churchill was pinning the blame actually on anybody he could find, and Churchill <laughs> and was one of them. <laughs> The Orc, as he was nicknamed in the, in the, in the British Army, uh, he went on in his retirement to teach or as an instructor at Camberley, the British Army Staff College. And he gave a lecture in August 1964 on the topic operational strategy revisited. Have you seen his uh, manuscript? Mm. And he told the student officers that, I quote, the big blunders in all wars and campaigns are usually strategic. Nonetheless, he maintained, the military students tend to con concentrate almost exclusively on the tactical aspects of the lessons of military history. The reasons, he thought, uh, was that strategic errors are not self-exposing as are tactical errors. And as the former are dimly lit and therefore not evident to minds too exclusively immersed in tactics, the military student often misses their significance and in this way deprives himself of the value, valuable uh, guiding lights which these provide as safeguards against future disasters. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a quite wise man's words. But I was wondering, did uh, the British army and the defense leadership during the war start that process to, to learn from? And, and how did they do it institutionally and in education and, and so forth? Yes, some lessons were learned from the campaign. And uh, there are some commentators who say, you know, people really did learn from the mistakes, although they sometimes find difficulty in pointing to exactly what they're talking about. But I think one of the greatest lessons from that campaign that applies to campaigns that are happening now and in the recent past is a lack of a common understanding of the word strategy. And I think if you cross-examine uh, historians, military people, uh, strategists, on what is their definition. If you had half a dozen, if you had six on a platform, you'd get six different answers. Um, because strategy has, if you look it up in the dictionary, has so many different meanings. And I define the process of strategy as a process, as I alluded to in the talk, the process of balancing the ends to be achieved against the ways and means available. Now that's a difficult process at the best of times, and it almost always results in you not having enough as a military person, ways and means for what the politician wants you to do. So you have to argue back with the politician to let the politician realize that there is risk. And if you're doing that well, you quantify the risk, and you therefore lead leave your political leader to assess whether that risk is risk that people are prepared to take or it's not. Now, this is a hard process, and it requires good personal relations between the political level and the military to be able to have this frank conversation. And it didn't happen in the British campaign in Norway. And I think very often in more modern campaigns, in Iraq and Afghanistan, for example, it didn't happen either. And there's a, a lack, I think, of intellectual rigor of having a discussion about strategy, but first defining it. And nowadays, when people ask me about strategy, I say, I'm not prepared to discuss strategy with you until we have a de definition. And your definition can be different from mine. It's just I want to know when you use the word strategy, what are you talking about? Because when I use it, this is what I'm talking about. And I don't think that sort of conversation 
happens enough today, and it certainly didn't at that time. Mm. I, I don't know if you agree, yeah. but... Yeah. Yes, yes, I do. Um, did the British at any point involve the Norwegian commanders in the thinking both about strategy and, and tactics or, or operations in Norway? Absolutely not. I think from a very early stage, um, there was again a, a cultural piece about what would we learn from the Norwegians? And it was a lack of having contact with the Norwegian military, you know, not having a military attaché in Oslo is unbelievable. Not having personal relations to know when you're talking to people uh, at the head of another service in another country, to have established a relationship prior with that person. Um, and I think that is a lesson that I think has been learned, not just from this campaign, that nowadays, in a multinational operation, um, I think people generally realise in the military that a good personal relationship with your opposite number can overcome a multitude of differences in national policy, in doctrine, um, in perception. If you've sat down and had a really good conversation with somebody who you treat as a friend, you can overcome enormous difficulties. And that certainly wasn't the case at that stage. Mm. A, a big lesson. Yeah. Though it, I, I should mention that some of the British, well, some of the British commanders in Norway, in, in the operational theatre, were able to establish good relations with the Norwegian commanders. For example, Paget in, in, in the south and a lot of other. And, and as you mentioned, of course, the, 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 the um, uh, Claude Auchinleck, yeah. was able to do that. And, and the French commanders. And, and, and the Betois as well. Uh, so if, when I study the, the, the 1940 campaign from a Norwegian vantage point, I can see that the, the main difficulties is between the governments on the governmental level, on the grand strategy level, not on the operational and tactical level where they were able to develop gradually quite cordial relations to the, to the extent that when the evacuation order became known to the Norwegian chief of defense, he understood the reasoning and why the Brits had no choice. Uh, because Norway's freedom would not be won in Norway, but on the continent. And the British and the French, they just needed to defend the UK and to rescue all forces they had uh, in, in, in the different operational theatres. So uh, they were able to establish these relations quite, quite, uh, over a quite short period of time. So we can just imagine uh, what would have happened if they had something to build on from before, but they, but they didn't. But I think early on in the campaign, such huge and obvious mistakes are obvious to us nowadays, that one of the first things Chamberlain or the Chiefs of Staff should have done is to get somebody of really senior rank to go to Norway and sit alongside Ruger. Mm. Um, they established liaison officers, but of far too junior a level. There needed to be somebody very senior, either political or military, or both, to sit alongside him and share the big plan together and how each force could help the other. That never happened, and that was one of the limitations of, uh, of Chamberlain yeah. as a leader, and a limitation of the Chiefs of Staff not to jog his elbow and say, this must be done. Just like the Chief of Staff, as soon as they heard, and they heard quite early, there was a row between... Um, Cork and Mackesy to send somebody of senior rank out mm. to sit down with them and sort things out. As it was, it was left to fester mm. and ended up a, a, a huge contributor to the shambles. Mm. The, the first that was sent to Norway was uh, Admiral Edward Evans, Ed, Evans of the Antarctica. Yes. But he, he was sent by Churchill, I think, to, to report on the fact-finding mission. With the Belgians. Yeah, okay. 
So oh. Bork was appointed at about 24 hours notice by Churchill, old friend, brought back from retirement, and he received his orders, the orders that his verbal orders and had no written orders, in a car with Churchill between the House of Commons and the Admiralty. <laughs> now that's about 300 metres. So the car, even if it was driving very slowly, wouldn't have allowed much briefing. And that was an imitation of Churchill's. Mm. <laughs> his, Terrible. His, his paper and his uh, lectures on his mission is kept at the library at the Royal Geographical Society. And it's quite interesting reading. Right. Because he was used by the Norwegian Information Service in London almost as a propagandist after, uh, after the campaign. Sure. But, but, but there, was a, there was another one, and that's Brigadier Dudley Clark. Yes. Um, he was sent on a fact-finding mission to Norway 10 days after the German attack, uh, and on another one shortly after. And in 1948, he published a book about his wartime experiences, among them the missions to, to Norway. But the interesting thing uh, I want to pick up on is that Field Marshal Archibald Wavell Wavel. wrote a foreword in, in, in the 1948 version. And Wavell, he, he claimed in his, uh, in his text that the British army in the beginning of almost any war is marked by lack of foresight, improvisation, and orders practically, practically impossible to follow. But, and that's his point, strangely enough, according to, to Wavell, they win in the end. So <laughs> when did that happen during, uh, well, in, 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 uh, in the Second World War? When did they start to learn and, and, and what was the tipping point? Much, much later. Mm. Um, certainly in the Desert War in about 1942, but that's you know, three years into the war before these lessons are learned, and better commanders are in position, and people are learning lessons. The trouble is that nowadays, campaigns can be so short, there's no time to learn these lessons. Unless you're prepared at the start of a campaign, you lose. I wonder if there are any questions from the audience. Yes. Uh, to have a microphone, yeah. I can, please. Hello? And yeah. please introduce yourself with the name first. It's, it's working. It's, it's better. My name is Lars Reinertsen, and I'm here with my mother, who is uh, the daughter of one of the commanding officers up there in the, at the time. I had a question about, I hear stories of my grandfather speaking atrocious English, and I wonder if language was a barrier at that time. Very much so. Yeah. Um, the appalling linguistic skills of the British, however bad they are nowadays, <laughs> And all I can say in your language mainly is mang attack. Um, very, very few people uh, spoke Norwegian. And I guess in the, the countryside in uh, Norway, in fishing villages and Namsos and Undelsnes, there weren't many people who had any reason to speak English, and German was probably the second language. Yeah. So I think that's a very important point. Um, and certainly the British Army made great efforts uh, after the war, rather than during it, to improve ling linguistic skills. Mm. But um, now I think it's absolutely essential in uh, campaigns, and seen to be, linguistic skills. I think you're absolutely I, right. I might add that uh, the, government had the, uh, the Norwegian government had the same problem. They had to use Hambro, the, 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 the president of the of parliament, to translate for the, for the ministers. And that could be quite difficult because many of the ministers, they were mad because of uh, the, the, the British and, and, and um, Hambro was meant to translate word for word, but he had to find you know, a more pleasant way to, <laughs> ways to put things. <laughs> coming up. Uh, the microphone is there. It's working. Then please introduce yourself and your name. Um, <clears throat> I'm, my name is Paul Myhre. I'm a descendant of a family in Narvik in 1940. Uh, you discussed uh, 
the discussion between Cork and Maxi in Arabic. And um, uh, we have heard, we are of course, as the rest of the world, uh, impressed by Churchill and, and everything he did. But scrutinizing what he did in Narvik uh, um, uh, learns about his character in a way that I at least didn't know earlier. So my question is, the discussion between uh, Cork and Mackesy uh, has been seen as a, a discussion of the level of risk uh, when attacking Narvik from from ships after a bombardment from, from ships. And, and, and um, you f kind of feel that uh, Mackesy was more, um, he, he wouldn't take as many risks as Cork and, and Churchill. But uh, when I, I have actually the, the records that, um, that uh, Cork made after the war, and it's quite clear in the records that both he and Churchill uh, recognized that there would be massive loss, uh, loss of both civilians and military in Narvik if the attack was, was uh, uh, done. So the question is, uh, are the British people, and I am quite sure that the Norwegian people is, are not aware that uh, Churchill was actually willing to risk 5,000 people in Narvik uh, for a political, he, he, he used himself the word uh, a political success, not a military success in Narvik. And beside that, you were discussing the, the strategy and it was highly uh, discussed among both politicians and military whether Narvik was a a uh, valuable target at all. So what can you say, say about uh, the kind of military ethics of such a uh, position of Churchill? I mean, two things there in particular. One, Churchill's insistence that the main effort, the priority, should be Narvik. When most other people were saying it should be Trondheim, and he, the government was getting advice um, from Norway, from uh, other interlocutors uh, in other countries uh, and am ambassadors elsewhere who were saying you must work together with the Norwegians and they want you to be in the Trondheim area. You know, the, the, this whole business about German freighters and Narvik, that is no longer the top priority. And Churchill, he, he had a mind blockage about that. He referred to Narvik as my first and my pet love. <laughs> and he hadn't got it out of his mind that, yes, the whole Narvik scheme was very important months before, but right now, the focus must be Trondheim. That was the first thing. The second thing is that <coughs> Churchill thought he knew a lot more about military affairs than he did. Mm. Yes, he'd written a lot of wonderful books about the Duke of Marlborough, um, uh, he'd had experience in the First World War, commanding a battalion on the Western Front for about five minutes. Um, he thought he knew a lot more about it. And compared to the other members of the War Cabinet, he did. He was an expert. But he didn't really understand the difference between war on paper and war in practice and in reality. And I think in the Narvik instance, he was urging Cork to attack. But Cork as I mentioned, never felt sure of himself enough to say to Mackesy, watch my lips, this is an order, attack and do it now. Because Cork, I don't think, had confidence that the attack would be successful. And Churchill never gave a direct order to Cork. He just kept saying to Cork, come on, why aren't you doing something? Why aren't, get that chap Mackesy to... But he never gave a direct order. And in the rest of the war, Churchill never gave a order countering the advice, the firm advice he'd been given by the Chiefs of Staff. There is no recorded decision where he says, I'm sorry, do it. And I think that goes back to Gallipoli in the First World War, where Churchill was urging the attack of the Dardanelles in Gallipoli, and uh, the, the thing was disastrous. And he knew 
that he couldn't, as he said later after the war, I couldn't afford two Gallipolis in one lifetime. <laughs> have four comments. I will repeat. It's a uh, man with glasses, blue jacket, uh, black jumper, red jumper. <laughs> and while uh, the next speaker is uh, posing a comment, you can prepare. But we, uh, I will urge you all to be short. So there are many people wanted to say. Please. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sir John, for a most interesting uh, presentation. Uh, my name is Thomas Bartolson. My father and four uncles were in the battle in Narvik as Norwegian servicemen. Um, at a much later stage during the war, Churchill was an advocate for uh, an invasion uh, to take place um, to Finnmark and also to Mursjön. Moshoim being in the south of Buda and Finnmark, the furthest north. Um, uh, something that his, his officers uh, were quite opposed to. Um, but it is known that there was quite, quite some debate uh, on this topic. Uh, um, was was uh, was this motivated by a sense of wanting a revenge to the Germans uh, after his uh, after the the uh, British campaign? That was my first question. My second question is: um, Was there the the cooperation between Norwegian servicemen officers in exile in Britain? and British intelligence. Um, how did that, that develop? Uh, was it better in 41, 42, 43? Thank you. Mm. Yeah. Um, your first question, Churchill remained, had an obsession about campaign, further campaigns in Norway, right throughout the war. Uh, he always wanted some, to, to, to get action. And if action couldn't happen here, why can't it happen there? And right through to 1944, he wanted another operation in Norway. Um, and the chiefs of staff were vehemently opposed to that because it would detract strength from the operations that were already going on. Um, funnily enough, the Germans, of course, um, reinforced Norway, were uh, hugely fearing another British attack. And I think I'm right in saying that in 1945 there were still 400,000 German troops in Norway um, because they feared this attack. And maybe, you know, uh, Churchill felt there was a political uh, angle to this that, um, you know, at least if he kept pressing and if the operation started to happen there, more German troops would be distracted away from other places into Norway. In answer to your second question, um, the, the British operations that actually took place, as you know, after 1940, were more in the terms of commando raids. And yes, there was a good liaison at a low level with uh, people who had escaped from Norway, with uh, Norwegians uh, in Britain, providing intelligence and helping those commando forces to carry out raids in the Lofoten Islands and the heavy water plant and these other raids that took place. Thank you. Yeah. My name is uh, Tom Just Olsen. Uh, except for having uh, uh, uncles and fathers, and my father and uh, as sailors, torpedoed X number of times during the war, uh, none of them really participated in the, in the fighting in Norway in 1940. But I think you, you jumped over a very important question here. Why did the Germans attack? Why? Because they liked the Norwegian uh, Lutefisk. Uh, <laughs> they knew that the British were, com were coming. They knew. They knew. And how did they know? Um, your competitor on, in the field, you know, uh, Anthony Dix, he writes that uh, um, a member of uh, uh, the, you know, uh, uh, the, the British government had a, a conversation with uh, Marcus Wallenberg. And Marcus Wallenberg, he was running uh, Scandinavia's largest bank back then. His brother took off the, the German business, and he took over the Allies. Okay? And he was told 
he was told that uh, the British government was planning to attack, attack Narvik and also, you know, attack um, the, the, the mines in, uh, in Kiruna. And so he was alarmed. And uh, how he then uh, told uh, the, the Germans, we don't know, but uh, he, they did. So, they, so the Germans, they knew that the British were on their way. And that the last meeting, uh, I think it was with Lord Halifax, that was, you know, between uh, Marcus Wallenberg and Lord Halifax, that was in January 1940. By then, uh, Churchill had been sitting in his office and counting how many ships were torpedoed. You talk about the phony war. It wasn't more phony that, that was every day a British ship or a ship we related to going contraband to, to, to Britain were torpedoed. So the Norwegian uh, commercial fleet was of very uh, huge importance, uh, and Churchill knew that. And uh, uh, so... Uh, Turtle was not a friend of Norway, let's put it that way, you know, it's very simple. So uh, that was the two things. Uh, it was important for, um, uh, well, uh, of course, you know, the mines, and that was important to, to stop the mines, and it was important to get the Norwegian merchant fleet. That was the reason why the Britain wanted to attack uh, Norway, and that was the reason that the Germans wanted to prevent that they got it. Uh, and they got about half of the mer uh, merchant fleet or something, or... More. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, my comments. No, that's absolutely true. That the the uh, Germans, I mentioned um, about Admiral Rader, he had heard rumours that the British were very interested in um, preventing the Germans uh, reinforcing the western <coughs> uh, coast of, uh, of, of, of the Norwegians, reinforcing the western coast of Norway. And um, the Germans decided to take preemptive action. <coughs> There were a lot of security leaks. Um, the British tended to blame the French. The French, no doubt, blamed the British. But there were a lot of security leaks and diplomatic traffic um, that were coming back to the Germans, knowing that this was going to take place. Um, and uh, the British were hoping that as soon as the Germans reacted, they would be able to react faster. And the huge and catastrophic security breach uh, leak, leak um, uh, meant that the, the whole thing didn't happen like that at all. And both fleets were going there practically at the same time. And it, the British fleet came within an ace of um, cutting the German fleet off, and the whole thing would have been history. But, you know, Hitler made a gamble, and the gamble paid off. Contrary to the advice he was getting, from his military advisers. They said, this is a crazy plan, it's not gonna work. And one of the most serious outcomes, I suppose, of the campaign in Norway was Hitler's self-belief. All my advisers told me it couldn't happen. I'm a genius, it happened. And in future, when they tell me it can't happen, I'll make it happen. Uh, the invasion of France, most of the advisers said, this is crazy, it'll, it'll never work. It worked, I'm a genius. And that, of course, in the end, was the downfall of Germany in the Second World War. But there was a lot of heartbreak in between. Thank you. Black Jumper. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm Hawken Nilsson. Into um, your, you should have it into yeah. your, here. <laughs> right there. <Yeah. laughs> Sorry, I'm Hawken Nilsson. I'm just an ordinary interested citizen. No prominent ancestors <laughs> to point to. Um, you mentioned at the start of your presentation that there were quite some indicators that uh, Germany was planning something for Norway. So my question is, um, what were the indicators? Who received them on the British side? And how were they processed? Thank you. I think it's chapter four in my book, <laughs> <laughs> which is an analysis um, of what went wrong in the intelligence. It's, I think the chapter's called The Jigsaw Puzzle, indicating that there were masses of bits on the table that made up the puzzle. It wasn't the lack of bits on the table, it was the lack of somebody saying, but that bit fits with that bit, and that bit with this bit, and isn't this producing a picture? And a lot of it was, as I mentioned, group think, oh, it can't happen, this was quite all right. Churchill said, I went to bed on the eve of our operation, uh, fully satisfied that uh, nothing was going to happen. Arnside said, oh, no, everything's quite all right. There's a lot of complacency. And 
I mean, really good example of how not to carry out intelligence operations. Uh, and at the time, a joint intelligence committee, which there is in Britain now and has been since about 1940, didn't operate properly then. Each service ministry had their own intelligence staff and each protected the information they had from the other service ministry to advance their own position. If they joined up all those pieces, they'd have seen the jigsaw puzzle all made up. And that was one of the... I mean, it's incredible to think that people were like that in those days, but they were. And also, senior commanders like Arnside, the intelligence community then weren't the brightest and best, as they are now. There were a lot of fairly second-rate officers in British intelligence. It was a bit of an old boys' club. And um, Arnside had a very low opinion of his intelligence staff and thought, I know best. I've been around. I've been a general for 20 years, which he had been, and nobody can tell me about intelligence. I, my instinct, I know about this. And by the way, I don't think the Germans are very good anyway. And when you have that sort of cultural thing, and institution, cultural and institutional, as I mentioned, you bring those two together, and it's not a happy mixture. Thank you. Thank now you. we have the red jumper here, but then we can open for two more comments, questions. And then we should go to this side, I think, because now we've been here all the time. <laughs> here. Now, first we take behind there, because you haven't been speaking before, and then you. Okay, thank you. Please. Thank you. Uh, I, I wanted... Uh, Do you have a name? Uh, yes, Turid Kongsvik. First female, I, be, I believe. And my question is not... Uh, it's at another level. I have no ancestors neither. But I wonder if you or anybody else has digged into the modus operandi at the level of other countries' forces, French, Polish, Austrian, which came to Narvik, do, uh, uh, do you know uh, whether uh, they have the same sort of problems at the decision-making level between being strategizing, or with the French being very Cartesian, perhaps they uh, are better at the strategic, but they're not as good at implementation? Is there any th studies on that score? Thank you. No, I think the French had quite a, a structure and hierarchy and a number of senior officers. Um, who were involved in the campaign. Um, and they, I think, did learn lessons after it, but of course the defeat of France followed the following month, so they had no opportunity to put it into practice. The Polish troops had, I think, four battalions there, uh, raised from Polish troops who were in France. Um, they played a very important part at the tactical level in the campaign at Narvik, but no part whatsoever in the strategic uh, level. So it's important to underline their contribution, um, but it wasn't at the strategic level. Thank you. Then we have a question, comment behind there. Thank you. Yes, uh, hello. I'm Tor Names Larsen. I'm uh, just uh, very fond of the meeting, and I hope we will never forget about this uh, subject. But I am born in uh, east of uh, Norway. We have been a lot on the coast on the north, but um, I'm coming from a city, Tønsberg, and I have a question. Can you say something about the campaign of Valle? What happened there Ooh. when <laughs> they starting to bomb after, actually, they, they saw, uh, saw that uh, it was a freedom coming ahead? That's a good question. Tom, yeah. do, you, do you know the Valle campaign? I guess you do. Um, I'm not... No, familiar it's, it's, with where we're talking about, actually, or when? It's, uh, it's uh, w w one of the targets of the bomber command in, in the... Uh, after 1940? Uh, long after. It was in 1945. Not 1945. Oh, I'm afraid, you know, it was afraid I know tankers. nothing about that, but yeah. Tom so, uh, I, I don't. I don't think Churchill had anything to do with that. It, awesome. it, it was, it was one, one of a long list of targets that uh, uh, the bomber command uh, had. And uh, the, the interesting thing about that raid was that it was so close up to the, uh, uh, at the end of the war. It, it was in April? Yeah, April, yeah. April. yeah, yeah just, just before, the, before the peace came. Mm. And uh, some people actually were also were killed. 
Mm. It's really a, mm. a local story, but it's quite dramatic, just mm. before the end, war ended. Well, thank you so much. We'll have to do that. And then it's the last question, because we have to be out here at 8, and we also, also I made it possible for, the, for those of you who want to buy the book to have a signed copy. So the last question comes to you. I'll certainly take up the offer of the signed copy. Uh, I'm, mine is a naval question. It might be slightly out of scope for your book. There are some assessments that say the naval losses that Germany suffered in the spring of 1940 was such that it alone prevented the invasion of Britain in this late summer. Can you make an assessment of that suggestion? Um, th there were a lot of losses of submarines, German submarines at that time. S surface vessels. Two surface vessels. Yeah. yeah. Ten, yeah. Ten, ten, destroyers. ten destroyers, a couple of cruisers, and things like that were sunk by? Uh, here in Norway. Uh, quite. Uh, um, I haven't really followed that in the, uh, in the campaign. Um, certainly uh, what the Royal Navy were doing at the time um, were trying uh, as best they could to destroy the German shipping and had a, a considerable success. For example, the Scharnhorst and Neisenau, I think either one or both were seriously damaged on their way back to Germany by uh, British submarines. Mm. I think, uh, yeah, I think uh, the question was uh, badly stated. The, the question was badly stated. The suggestion was, and this is from uh, German naval sources, that they, the, uh, the Kriegsmarine lost so many German ships, uh, capital ships and destroyers, that they could not support an invasion of Britain. It just couldn't be done. Absolutely, uh, absolutely correct. Mm. That the uh, losses of German ships and British ships were fairly similar, but the British Navy was that big, the German Navy was that big, so proportionally, the German Navy lost far more, a far higher proportion. And uh, after that, it was very difficult for the Kriegsmarine to conduct successful naval operations, except for submarines. So it, it was, incidentally, an extremely important factor later in the war, you're absolutely right. Thank you. This is fabulous, sir, uh, Don Cleese. I mean, you, you're such a lecturer, and you have been sitting here. We could have, sit, we could have been two more hours. But now I think uh, it's also time to close in. And uh, as you understand, the interest for this campaign and the, you know, that part of World War II in Norway is of immense interest. And I'm quite sure the discussions will continue on the social media and all the groups afterwards. And thank you, Tom, for um, keeping up the temperament in the, your talk afterwards. I think we should give a big hand to Sir John Kesey. Yeah. It's possible, uh, John, Sir John Keyes will sit here on the scene. He will sign books if you want to buy. We had 10 books here. You can buy with them by Bips and other books you can buy out there, out there. So this is the chance. You just sit down here and the books are coming to you. Okay. <laughs>